Hi, my name's Alison. I prefer Ali. And I'm a therapist. I've trained in CBT, play therapy, cognitive hypnotherapy, um, anything and everything, really, because I found it quite apparent that no one size fits all. And regardless of people coming to me with anxiety and being same social economic background, same age, same everything, they did their anxiety differently. So anything that I could do was very, this is how you deal with anxiety. And, you know, it worked for some, not all. And it took a long time. I created an organisation called Ollie and His Superpowers. And what we are is, um, well, an army of therapists. And we're, my cat, <laughs> we're throughout the UK now. And our whole approach is about empowerment, not fixing and not giving advice. And about everybody that we meet, we've never met anyone like them before. So we stop, we look, we listen, we learn how they do their problem, how they communicate. We step into their world so that we can connect at the level we need to, to help them change the behavior or the thought process that's blocking them at the moment. And the way that we do that is by, well, I guess the easiest way is to explain how it all came about. I was working with mainly adults and a lady I've been working with with anxiety said that I need to bring my son along. Uh, oh, I've not worked with children before and, you know, I'm not convinced that the, the, the training that I'd had, I hadn't done any play therapy at that stage, would help. But she brought him along and she literally, she walked into my therapy room, this little lad who's about seven in his little football kit, and she said, sort him out, he's angry like his dad, and 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 she left. Safeguarding out the window, left of the I know. Anyway, so I, I'm, I'm sat there with this young fella and... Uh, not even having children of my own, you know, a little bit awkward. But I started off with, you know, hello, I'm Ali. Um, who are you? And his name was Peter. I said, hi, Peter. What's going on with you then? And this little fella, without looking at me, because I was yet another adult that was going to fix him or find things wrong with him because he wasn't good enough, said, I'm angry. <laughs> OK, OK, yeah, mum mentioned that. So I said, how do you know you're angry? He said, because everybody tells me I am. Who's everybody? Mum, dad, teachers, mum's friends, everybody. Right, OK. It was almost like he had this tattoo, I'm angry Peter. And he was really good at it too, I have to say. He, he was good at being angry. To the life of me, I don't know why I did what I did next, but it was the birth of something that I am really proud to say is revolutionising how we deal with children, teens and adults to help them move on by empowering them. So for whatever reason, I just I just started tapping my foot and I said, you know, I know um, that I'm getting angry because my foot starts tapping. What about you? How do you know? And you I don't know. I just get angry. They didn't want to engage with me. I was just another adult. But I carried on. <sighs> Got an hour. <laughs> So I said, yeah, yeah, my, my, my foot taps. So I think the part of me that I call angry must live in my sock. And, and I think that when I'm only a little bit angry, it just stays in my sock, but it lets me know because my foot taps. This little fella's face was a picture. Honestly, I think if he, if he could have left then, he would have promised to behave forevermore. <laughs> so I said, yeah, no, no. But I said, here's the thing. I said... That's me being a little bit angry. When I get a little bit more angry, I reckon that part of me, see what I'm doing, making it a part of me, not who I am. It's what we do with all emotions or superpowers, as we prefer to call them, or unicorns, or it doesn't matter what we call them, but they're a part of you. I said, well, no, you know, I, I think it runs up my body and it goes into my eyebrow because when I'm proper angry, my eyebrow goes up. I wish you could have seen his face. It was... <laughs> So I said, yeah, yeah, that's what happens with me. What about you? How, how do you know? He went, I don't know. I went, you must know. Come on, you must know. I pushed a little bit and eventually went, I don't know. As I said, he was good at being angry. <laughs> I just reached over and pretended to take something from his hand and I turned my back on him slightly. So he's there now. I can see him, but I'm not looking at him. I went, oh, wow, you are angry, aren't you? Peter, is he always this angry? Is he just angry because your mum's brought him here? What have I done? I've taken angry away from Peter and I'm holding it in my hand, but in my cupped hand and I'm stroking it. Subliminally, I'm saying it's young and it's small. 
<laughs> are you making Peter angry because his mum makes him go to ballet lessons? Why did I ask that? That was a real punt. He's in there in football kit, so I was hoping I'd get a no. I went, is that it, Pete? And Pete went, no, not, not that's not it. Okay. Are you making Peter angry because his mum makes you wear pink pyjamas? Hoping it would be a no, Pete. No. I think I asked about three or four questions that I hope I'd get a resounding no from. So we're about 20 minutes into the first time I've ever met this lad. Not three months, six months, still trying to build rapport, yeah? I asked a couple more stupid questions. <laughs> he got so cross because he was good at angry. He said, he's angry because he doesn't want to be the big boy. 20 minutes in to my first meet with him, not three months. Do the financial maths, because I know that matters, but do the emotional maths of how long this child would have to have spent with me feeling there was something wrong with them. 20 minutes. At that point, I would have stopped. That was a hell of a breakthrough. But I didn't. I carried on. Inside, I was leaping around the room. I mean, oh, he doesn't want to be the big boy. Pete, what, what, what does he mean? Peter then came and sat next to me and explained he'd got a little brother with additional needs and he wasn't very well, which explains mum's stress, doesn't it? And that everyone that came to the house came to see his mum or the baby and dad was a bit office at the moment because dad couldn't make the world right for everyone. So he was a bit, everyone was, and once too often Pete had said, mum, mum. And mum said, Pete, please, I need you to be the big boy. Nothing wrong with that, is there? Of course she'd say that. Didn't mean any harm by it, but what did he hear? He heard, I'm not loved, I'm not special, I'm not as important as my little brother. <laughs> Fundamental, if you drill down in all of us, what really matters? Are we loved? Are we valued? Do we matter? At that point, he, he thought he didn't. He's only young. <laughs> he couldn't see the bigger picture. So I carried on. By now, Pete's beside me. And I said, oh, wow, bless you. No, I get that. I get that. No wonder you're angry. Pete said, I think he's more upset than angry, really. <laughs> oh, wow. Let's bring upset out as well then. So we've got angry and upset. Oh, bless you. Pete, how can we help them? Now, on this occasion, the best Pete could come up with, and we're about 40 minutes into my session now, first session. He said, explain to mum. I said, well, have you tried explaining to mum? And I remember this as long as I live. He said, yeah, I told mum that I'm not angry, I'm a bit sad. And she told me to stop being shellfish. <laughs> so anyway, mum came back and I explained what we'd just done and what had happened. And bless her, she was mortified. She didn't realise that that one statement had had such an effect on her son. Picked him up, hugged him, promised never to say those words again, be the big boy. Great. Didn't think any more about it until two weeks later, I was in the first school that engaged us. Um, chatting away to the head teacher. And I saw Peter over the back with his friends. And I just went, you all right? Yeah, good. He went, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And I went, how's that? And he went, no, no, all good, good, good. But he looked a little bit sad. So I was like, are you sure? You, you know, you don't look. He went, grandma's died. I'm like, oh, no. Let's get to a meeting. What do you do? You do the right thing, don't you? And you stay with it. So I said, oh, mate, do we need to talk? Without breaking his stride, he reached into his chest and he said, no, I pulled out, Sad. I've told, told Sad it's OK. Grandma's with Grandad. They're happy. Sorry, I've got to go to football. Catch you later. Off he went. Yeah. <laughs> so he'd taken an hour with me and what I taught him about angry, and actually angry wasn't even angry, was it? He'd taken that. And he'd utilised it for the next emotional hurdle he hit. Bang. One session. So I thought, OK, well maybe that was a one off. So we tried using this method with other children. The concept that you're not angry, you're not sad, you're not anything. They're all just part of you. They're your team. And yes, in only we call them superpowers. Kids love superpowers. But, you know, you can call them anything you want. The model doesn't change. We just change our language. So, you know, sometimes those feelings are unicorns or butterflies or they're, I don't know, all sorts of things. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. 
It's a lovely way of getting the children to accept that they're not the label, they don't fit in a box, and that it's just a part of them. And all the other parts can help. Why does it work? I think it's because we separate it and make it a part of them so they can see the wood from the trees. But there's something bigger going on underneath. I truly believe there are no bad kids. I don't think there's too many bad adults either. I think everyone's doing the best with the knowledge they've got. And the problem is when you're a kid, you haven't got that much knowledge, have you? Yo, you're smart enough, but you don't really have a database yet, do you? It's cause and effect. You can't see the bigger picture. But I think all behaviour serves a purpose. And I absolutely believe it has a positive intent. In the beginning, anyway. <laughs> so Peter's anger, what was that about? It was letting him get out that frustration and maybe other things that he couldn't voice. But it was also notice me. No, we just write that off as attention seeking. But it was I'm hurting. Somebody noticed me. I don't know how to explain. That's what that was about. So rather than wipe it off, speak to angry. Ask it what's wrong. You'll find out it's sad because it doesn't want to be the big boy. Who knew? But the other thing, therapy just used to take way too long for me. People in therapy too long, they feel broken when they come to you. And if they're in therapy for a very long time, that just makes that feeling worse. And I just stood back and thought, why, why is it taking so long with the training that I had at that point? Here's one. This is a tree. Go with me. <laughs> These are the branches. The branches are the behaviours. And, you know, we're talking about children here, and I guess that's the bulk of our work, but we work with teens and adults. In fact, there's absolutely no point working just with the child, because if I work with a child in my therapy room, even if I get through and teach them that, you know, it's your superpower, you know, this is what we can do. Do, 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 do. When they're back in the classroom or back home, they can't exercise that muscle unless the teachers are using the same language and mum and dad are. So everything we do, we work with the whole, what well, it takes a village, doesn't it? Anyway, behaviours, anger, not sleeping, not paying attention, yeah, a myriad of anger, yeah. And, and, and what I've been trained to do is to deal with these one at a time. And if the rapport was there and the support was there, maybe you could for a little while. But all behaviour serves a purpose. These behaviours only exist because something's driving them. They're a way to communicate, a way to survive. And I mean all behaviours. And I mean, this might sound a bit, but seriously, think about it. People that um, drink too much, take drugs, they're behaviours. Why are they doing it? Initially, not because they had a death wish, because it helped. It helped the situation. It got them through. Unfortunately, we get stuck in our behaviours, don't we? And you will stay stuck in them if you just deal with the behaviour, unless you drill down to the root. And the root is an emotion. The emotion drives the behaviour. So you can spend months messing about up here. Or you can get to the root, the emotion that's driving that behaviour, and work with it. And that's what we do in the Oli model. And we don't just say, right, what do you need to do? We teach. So the kids I'm working with, I teach them how this stuff works, that so they can do it themselves, just like Peter. Parents. Our parents are doing the best they can with the information they've got. And we've all got limiting beliefs. And so we work with them too to help them so that they can help their kids so that nobody's in therapy any longer than they damn well need to be. Historically, we got dragged in as an organisation when everybody else had run out of ideas. So we got the kids everyone had given up on. We still do that. And I'm really proud because we turn them around and we really, really do. And not in months and months and months. Our measurables are showing six to eight sessions on average. Not always, depending on the complexity. But we don't stay with them till they're absolutely perfectly OK. We stay with them till we know they've got it and then they do the rest empowerment so that they don't need us that's how we stop this problem so we started working in schools and we do one-to-one -one work we work with the teachers we don't teach them to be therapists but we give them a lot of the language skills that we use and we tell them what we're doing with the kids so they can continue it in the classroom we work with mum and dad they need a bit of support but we do it in such a way that they don't feel that they're being judged as bad parents we involve them and just say, do you know what? If I can teach you this and you can work with your child and then you won't need to come and sit. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. Get around it. We get the whole village working together in every school and organisation that we go into. We got picked up by foster and adoption services. Those kids have got a lot of baggage, yeah? And they're never going to get a forever home. 
if the only emotion that they ever exhibit is anger. But we teach kids that poor old anger gets a bit of a raw deal. It's the one that gets shoved out in front all the time. But it's been shoved out in front by another emotion that maybe doesn't know how to speak up or express itself. And kids recognise that now. And they're looking behind their own anger to see what's really going on there so that they're talking to the right part so they can help it. We do an awful lot of work with alternative provision. As I said, we get dragged in when everyone else has given up on these kids. There are no bad kids. Situations, life, stuff. But give them the tools and empower them. And they can turn their own lives around with a little bit of support. So, yeah, now we have to open our own school to train therapists because lovely position to be in. I haven't got enough Ollie coaches. What a lovely position to be in. So <laughs> had to open a school to get more Ollie coaches so we could put Ollie coaches where they were needed. We do different things now. So we started with one to one work. Then the schools and we're, we're led by schools. We don't have any set off the shelf stuff. So if you said, well, I want one of those, one of those, you need to sit down and see what you want. Every school has different needs. So every time that we come in and talk to you, it's like, what do you need? And we'll adapt what we're doing specifically to that. And some schools said, well, okay, now you're working one-to-one -one with these kids and their families and you're helping the teachers that so we're all using the same letter. Da -da 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 -da. We've got a group of kids that probably don't need one-to-one. -one. There's nothing massive going on there, but they're just not quite, I call them my cusper kids and teens. So what we did was we set up programs called Ollie Kids, Ollie Teens. And these programs we run at school or in after-school clubs or whatever, whoever has pulled us in needs. And they're like five to six weeks, an hour a week, with a group of kids that have one thing in common. They're a little bit, cusper <laughs> but that's all they have in common and you know we have a set criteria we teach them their emotions are a part of them and how to communicate with them and resilience and what empathy all the big stuff but while we're doing that we're actually looking at them as individuals as well and making sure we tweak continuously so each of those individuals gets what they need at the end of those courses whether we're working with six-year-olds or 16-year-olds they get a certificate basically train them for six weeks <laughs> And they get a red t-shirt like us and you know what's really lovely they then use what they've learned about themselves and the stuff we've taught them to help the people around them family members people in school whatever there's one school absolutely love it every day kids take turns putting their red shirts on and being in the playground in case the other kids need a little bit of help with anything not big stuff just anxiety or maybe just someone to talk to or do you know it's pretty cool so we're doing one-to-one -one training for parents teachers professionals and again depending on what you need depends on the level of training that we provide and obviously <laughs> train to be an only coach but the one thing that's always bugged me was i will never have enough ollie coaches because the mental health i hate that emotional well-being situation in this country in every country is ridiculous the systems in place can't cope for a myriad of reasons um, we've got a model that is effective very, very quickly and long term that empowers, doesn't fix, so they don't need to come back and see us again. But we're only getting to the kids once there's a problem. And I thought the only way we're ever going to put a dent in what's happening in our country right now, every country, <laughs> because we're going international is to put a fire break in, spend a bit of time in Australia and family got farms out there and they have to burn down big chunks of land. So if there is a fire, the fire can't spread. Fire break, prevention. For how could we do prevention? So of all the things that came out of COVID, good and bad, the one good thing that came out of it is I had headspace and time to come up with what we call Ollie Prevent. And Ollie Prevent is a program that we deliver in schools and we deliver it to the whole school before there's a problem. And I can tell you, I've got six-year-olds that aren't frightened of anxiety because they recognise it for what it is. It's just their little bodyguard and it's trying to help them, but it doesn't realise they're six now, not four. Seriously. So our prevent programmes are for the whole school and we can deliver them however you need. 
So the last one that I did, I literally went into school for a day and I did each year group an hour at a time for a day. And again, over about five weeks, I was able to give them enough information in that time and enough skills that hopefully they won't be queuing up outside my therapy room when they hit their teens or any transition or any road bumps life throws at them. I've got the tools they can do it themselves. The sooner we get to them, the better. So we can do the whole school. Or we can do specific classes. We don't have set this off the shelf contracts. It's what do you need as an organization? And every school's different. That's us. There's so much more I could tell you about us. But in a nutshell, that's us. We're effective. We're making a big, big difference. We're doing something clever. Complete opposite. I can't read and write. I need things to be simple. And who knew that just by making things simple, I could start to change a massively complicated problem. If I've said anything that's any interest or you want more information, please get in contact. Have a look at us, www.olliniesuperpowers.com. Therapists all over the country. My job's just to get Ollie out there to as many of you as possible so we can help as many kids and families and teens as possible. I always get asked, okay, this might work for kids. But what about teens? What about grown-ups? As I said, the model doesn't change. The language does. And the interesting thing is when I'm working with an awful lot of adults and I say, well, you know, there's, your emotions are just parts of you in the Ollie world. You know, for children, we call them superpowers. Most adults say, yeah, I like that. They, they call them superpowers. But just to give you an example of how this can translate, I was working in one school in London and I was asked to work with one young chap that... Uh, quite a long list from the Senko, anger issues, disrespect for authority. It was quite a huge list. <laughs> would, would I have a chat with him? Everything else had failed. He'd seen three therapists and refused to work with them. So I walked into the room and this rather large lad, he was a big unit, I sat in the chair and he had proper anger issues. And I must admit, even I was a bit, ooh. So I introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm Ali. Oh. His name doesn't matter. And I said, you know, I'm here to see whether or not, you know, I can help you to help yourself to take back control. I said, uh, what do you think you need a little bit of help with? And he went, nothing. I said, well, you've got a bit of a list here. And I started to read down the list and he went, I ain't angry. I went, OK, this is somebody else's opinion. I completely get that. We do that, don't we? We look at things and go, oh, that behaviour is definitely anger. Couldn't be more wrong half the time, could we? Pete weren't angry. He was sad. So I said, oh, that's cool, mate. Don't worry. I said, uh, what would you call it? He went, I ain't angry. And I, I must admit, I thought, well, Ali, back off, because he was a big lump. <laughs> and I said, OK. And I screwed the bit of paper up and I threw it. And I said, OK, you're not angry. What would you call throwing chairs at teachers and spitting? And he went, I get vexed, didn't it? Now, I'm of an age where the only time I've heard that expression is when you can't marry your, your daughters off to Bingley or Darcy. I have no idea what he meant. Vexed, in it? But the point is, I don't need to know. What I need to do is not enforce, that's lovely, but we're here to deal with your anger, because that's just going to put a barrier up, isn't it? So I got another piece of paper out, and I wrote across the top, vexed, in it? And I said, how do you know you're vexed? So I just get it. I get like it. I said, what, is it, it what, what? And he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And my stomach, I just, so I just, 16 year old lad, I know. <laughs> I pulled Vexed out. And me and this lad worked with Vexed to understand why he was Vexed, what was driving Vexed to be Vexed, what was hiding behind it and creating these behaviours, what to do about it. He's all right now. I'm sure he still gets Vexed but he's all right now. If I said anything of interest, please get in contact. Happy to do a Zoom and give you more of a, an intro into the Ollie model and how you can get kids not being afraid of anxiety and recognising it as a bodyguard, all of that. I want to share what we do because it's up to all of us to stop what's happening in our country and help our youngsters. So please, please, please get in contact. Thank you for your time.